How's it going, everybody? My name is Antonio, and I'm back on the barbecue today with Ross McElroy, the uh, CEO of Fission Uranium, for uh, an update on what the company's been up to recently as they've uh, they've grown their exploration team, which might have been unexpected for some, so we're getting um, a much-desired update here that's going to be interesting to listen to. Who's not here with us today, though, is your financial advisor. This is going to be um, just a talk. It's going to be a talk that's general and impersonal in nature and one that will include a lot of forward-looking statements, just general hopes and dreams for the future, which means that besides taking everything with a grain of salt, you should always do your own analysis by consulting the official documents that the company has filed on setter.com. On top of that, I want you to know that Fission is a paying advertiser on this channel, which means that this should be considered uh, as an advertisement and not as independent research. But even still, I need you to understand that there are risks involved to um, investing in general, but especially when it's investing in the extractive industries, these are high risk industries. So please be prudent, wear your big boy pants and don't take rash decisions. Otherwise, you will lose your money. And trust me, I, I have, uh, I am known for rash decisions. That all said, I'm, uh, I'm not doing a company overview today because I've um I've had Ross on the channel many times uh, before. It was actually, the last time was just a few months ago, I believe two months ago. So I have a link on the screen and in the description and in a pinned comment where you can just go click on it and learn more about Vision if you hadn't before. So that all said, Ross, good to see you again. Uh, thank you for investing your time with me. Yeah, fantastic to be here with you again, Antonio. Pleasure is all mine, of course. Uh, I am looking forward. I'm overdue an update on fishing because it's been, uh, it's been, yeah, again, one, two months since we last spoke. And you, you've, uh, you've done a couple of things that are worth talking to. The first thing that I want to jump right into is you're staffing up on exploration geologists. But last time we spoke, you told me that you're, you're, you, you were mainly doing geotechnical drilling. Oh, that's finished, by the way. Uh, we'll talk about that as well. But you told me that you hope to be in production in in the next five years or so. So I. I just always assume Fission is a development company. So why would you be growing your exploration team right now? Sure. I think the, um, you know, the rationale is fairly simple and straightforward. And by the way, we are, I think, primarily a development company. We, um, you know, we've got the triple R deposit. We're moving that towards production. We're hitting all the milestones as we, as we've laid out uh, all the timelines and, um, you know, I think your 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 comment about five years to production is uh, is our working um, thesis as well, and we're 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 very confident that we'll be able to meet that. So why exploration? You know, it's, there's there's two prongs of this business that that are key. Um, if you consider uh, exploration, you know, from the time of discovery until you can move it into uh, you know, a, a new discovery, advance it in through the economics and into production. That's you know typically about a fifteen year period. So you know a, a mine is a always a depleting resource, and we're five years out from initial production. We're looking at a ten year mine life on the triple R deposits. So as you diminish the ore body, you are always looking for something else to feed it to. So the timing is actually right it's critical to be exploring now so that we you know i think the chances of a new discovery at pls is very real very high and so just knowing the timelines in there to make a new discovery get it uh you know as part of the production story um i think that the the timelines make a lot of sense and uh you know we you know the other point being that you know pls is such a uh uh, a great piece of, uh, of of land. We think that it's um, very, very underexplored and has the potential for new discoveries. So not only is it key for future production, but uh, you know we think there's there's other tremendous uh, upside in, in discovery as well, which will continue to uh, build shareholder value. But does that mean that you're going to be drilling this year? Like, is that something for this year? Is that just generally a, a long term plan here? Well, it's it's going to be a long term plan. Um, I suspect that our first exploration drilling will probably be in the winter two thousand twenty four. So whether that's you know in December of of this year, or January next year, that's really what we're um, what we're marking. So I've brought on uh, some new key team members to the exploration group. Right now, they're going through uh, project data, the information on the property, where best to do further drilling. And, and part of that drilling is going to be, um, 
you know, expanding outwards from the known deposit where, you know, we think we've got a, a pretty good chance to be able to expand the zones that we have, um, but also testing for new discoveries up the very, very prolific Patterson Lake corridor. But I, you know, by the time we, we get around to figuring out exactly where the drill targets are going to be, the size of the program, I think we're really looking at a winter program rather than anything this fall. Mm. Okay, winter program next year. Yeah, winter for us usually begins in December preparation. Once the ice gets thick enough up up north, um, you know, and start, uh, you know, doing all the steps necessary to get a program in place. It's really sort of mid-December when you begin that process and um, drills typically are spinning by middle of January. So, okay, but it, it's relatively short term, like it's a six month type of thing. It's not like a three year type of thing. That's sort of what I was getting to. Yeah, exploration is typically seen season by season, you know, mm. whereas development is a, is a full 365 day a year, um, you know, uh, process. Uh, exploration tends to typically, you know, be focused in the winter season, which would be drilling January to April, we'll say. And then you'll, uh, you know, based on the results of that, you might go back in and do more work um, starting in june to september really that's that's kind of the, the windows we look towards okay and you said that you're you're drilling um well you're you, you hope to be drilling for both new discoveries and also expanding the pls project i like that uh but there's also there there has been historical drilling on your project right are you going to be do you think you're going to be going to those parts of the deposit or is this more of a of a greenfields type of thing a bit, uh, a bit of both, I suppose. But really, I think the emphasis here is is on greenfield discovery. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, we'll. Uh, I think if we you, you break it down geologically, there's the Patterson Lake corridor. We know how prolific that is. We have the Triple R deposit uh, in the middle of our PLS, or sorry, the Triple R deposit right in the middle of PLS. You've got about three kilometers to the northeast. You have Next Gen with the Aero deposit. Another three kilometers to the northeast, you have the Spitfire zone on a Cameco Rano um, a joint venture. But it just tells us that this is a, a huge, very prolific uh, trend. And so we want to continue exploring along it. We know we have um, parallel uh, systems to the south uh, on there, which we call Forest Lake. But um, I think that's equally, you know, high potential for for new discoveries as well. We've got just a, a plethora of um, geophysics targets already that we have on the, you know, that we've done from past work. Um, so we know that these are the right kind of targets to be testing for new exploration. So um, I think that if any uh, anybody really took a look at the PLS project, you would say it's it's quite underexplored with respect to drilling. And yet the potential for new discoveries is probably as good or better than any project I can think of in the Athabasca Basin. So we think it's the time's right to, um, you know, to, to start moving that part of the business forward as well. Does your geological thesis stay the same though? Like, is it, cause, cause what you found could be some other companies are referring to it as Athabasca 2.0. So this is not your typical, you know, a, a kilometer below the unconformity type of deposit. This is more shallow deposit. Is it the same geological thesis that you're using? Yeah, um, I think this is really the beauty of PLS is that the targets um, uh, tend to be near surface. You know, certainly the ones that we know of, it, it's, um, it's not very deep to get down to basement. Where the triple R deposit is uh, right now, that area is about starts at around 55 meters below the surface. There are other areas on the, the property where you're down to about 100 to 150 meters, but that's still considered relatively shallow by, by any standards in the Athabasca. So I think we're blessed with having um, near surface uh, potential deposits. So that really cuts down on the expense to explore. Uh, you can, you know, put a lot more drill holes in, you know, for a given budget uh, when your targets are, are shallow near surface. And plus the, you know, all the, the techniques that you use to explore the geophysics, geochemistry, all these things are more effective the closer a deposit is to, uh, to surface. So mm -hmm. I think we're, you know, in a fortunate uh, position that way. 
there's quite a lot of there is quite a few leaks actually in the area though uh one that sits right on top of a, a big part of your uh, known deposit is that the case for the rest of your property too or, or are the lakes concentrated on one spot well you find that the lakes are actually features of um of uh structural uh occurrences deeper down so in other words geology fault zones um, these typically are where deposits in the Athabasca Basin occur on. They become recessive, which means you get lakes over occurring on top of uh, the shear zones that host deposits. That's pretty typical. It's almost standard throughout the Athabasca Basin. So when you see a deposit, you know there's a lake nearby. It's just uh, the, the, the way they are. Um, so it's really no different at PLS. Uh, you know, we, we have lakes. Um, the the fault zones are are where you're going to be looking for the deposits, and those fault zones tend to create valleys, and so valleys, you know, end up uh, in the lower parts filling in with 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 lakes. So it's it's really something we're pretty used to in in the Athabasca Basin. Uh, nothing different on PLS than it would be, you know, on other projects elsewhere. Mm. And that's uh, specifically the PLS that you're talking about here in terms of exploration. What about West Clough? Do you think something's happening there? Uh, not at the moment. You know, our um, our our view is still that the PLS represents the, the best underexplored piece of real estate out in the Athabasca Basin. Um, you know, West Clough looks interesting as well, but at this point, it's not part of the uh, the near term exploration. Now we may you know, have a little bit further look at it with our team once they, they get, um, you know, a little little used to used to that property and, and checking the, uh, the potential for um, for the expiration, uh, you know, likelihood of, of discovery up at, at West Clough. But for now, it's really all about PLS. And the, the I think the key part here is the newly hired expiration team led by Kanan uh, Seriuglo, uh, it was now our VP exploration and, and James Haley, our senior geologist. These are guys that were absolutely key to the discovery of the triple R deposit um, back in 2012. And even for the J zone discovery on our um, previous uh, company, Fission Energy back in 2009. These are the key geologists. So they're very, very uh, familiar already with the PLS project. So there's, uh, you know, I'd say there's really no learning curve for, for these guys to, you know, start um, assessing where the targets are, are going to be on this property. So they, you know, they're already going in with armed with years and years worth of, uh, uh, of understanding of, of the PLS project. Kanan is, as you said, he used to work for you uh, before that, right? And then he moved on to a different company and now he's gone from that company back to what, why is that development happening? Like what, what is it something like a is it a personal relationship or something that that's moving him around or what why is this happening? Well, we you know he was a, a consultant geologist for us back in um, you know between what would it, probably two thousand and nine up until about two thousand and twenty. Um, you know at that time exploration uh, you know was 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 a hard business in, in in the uranium sector. The uranium prices were low if you recall. You know you know in the eighteen nineteen dollar a pound range. And so, you know, companies really couldn't get finance to explore. And so, you know, we we ended up really reducing the team. Kanan went uh, to go work for a, another company called 92 Energy, was very successful with them, made a, a discovery for those, uh, for that group on the eastern side of the basin. But um, he was very interested to get back to, um, you know, back to Fission and PLS, which is his favorite property, I think, by far, in anything he's uh, he's explored in, in in the basin, so the opportunity was there when we really wanted to, you know, start uh, getting the exploration group moving again and building it and and looking for, you know, getting the experience of guys that have, that have already you know spent years on the project. It was just such a natural evolution um, to bring Kanan back. He's by far the best uh, uranium exploration geologist that I've worked with. Hmm. So is this Lancaster angry at you that you poached him? Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, he he was uh, searching, so you know, I wasn't. Um, I don't think I'd be accused of poaching. Uh, you know, I I was approached by 
by by Kane and that he was you know looking for new opportunities. So mm. yeah, I was, just, I was very, very receptive to it. I'm, I'm mostly kidding. Um, but it's a good story to know that that you didn't poach him. Um, I was actually watching a, a long story. Anyways, that's where I'm coming from. But it was a joke. Um, I, I am though wondering why. I, I'm wondering behind the. I want to understand the why behind um, restarting drilling now. In, in not, I mean, you explain to me why it makes sense in terms of you know sh unlocking shareholder value over the long run. But in relation to what the market is saying, as in that's basically because real discoveries right now are not really getting real value for those discoveries you bring up 92 energy uh they're not in my opinion they're not getting valued properly relative to if 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 a company would make the, a comparable discovery that has uh the, the value of those rocks is the same as those of let's say 92 energy but in another in another commodity let's say that's gold equivalent grades or something like that. those are crazy grades that we're talking about and they would get huge values for that so to me, that sounds like the market is saying right now that it doesn't want to finance discoveries. And so you told me more or less why it makes sense for the company to do exploration right now, but why does it make sense for it to be now? I think the difference here is the quality of the type of discoveries we can have at PLS versus anywhere else. I mean, mm. look at the triple R, for example. This is a, um, a very high-grade uh, basement-hosted deposit that's large, 130 million pounds as a global resource. Look at the aero deposit on the same trend. You're looking at, um, at what, about 350 million pounds uh, of high grade uranium mineralization. I mean, these are orders of magnitude higher than than uh, the other discoveries that, that you might be referring to. So, and that's just the potential for the type of deposit that you can you can find in the PLS area. And if you, um, you know, have a look at, say, F3 uranium that, that made a new discovery about 10 kilometers to the north of us, uh, you know, prior to discovery, they had a market cap of around uh, 25, 30 million dollars. They made a discovery showing high grade results similar to what we would find in the uh, in the triple R deposit. Now you have a market capitalization of about 140, 150 million dollars. So a truly good exploration discovery can, uh, you know, increase your your market capitalization significantly. So um, even in know, this market, really about the quality of the deposits itself. I'm sorry for interrupting there, but even in this market, do you think it, a discovery can increase your market cap even in this market? Uh, undoubtedly, it will. You know, I think a, a good. Uh, good discovery in any market will will absolutely move the needle. I, I think back to our, our own discovery of PLS on the, the triple R deposit that we discovered in the fall of 2012. The uranium market then was absolutely abysmal. The prices were falling off. You'd just come off of the, um, the Fukushima event. Nobody cared about the uranium sector at that time. And yet with that discovery, you know, it was... Uh, you know the 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 market cap of the company went up significantly so i think no matter what the market conditions are like a good discovery really does make a difference but we also know that the uranium sector right now is uh, you know the the price of the commodity continues to move uh higher and i think that the good discoveries are absolutely critical to this business and um uh, they 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 do make a difference for a company do you think any of this will slow down your development plans, though? Not a chance. No, I'm uh, absolutely um, uh, focused on on getting the development side. In fact, we continue to increase our team. Uh, we've we've now got all the key players in place for the development uh, cycle. We have obviously we've had our uh, vice president of project development in place for a few years now but we have our permitting expertise. We now have uh, Gary Haywood, our VP uh, project development, has got all the key players that he needs on his team to be able to move the project forward. We're, um, you know, we're in a very attractive cash position with around 45, $46 million in the treasury. Uh, we know all the steps that we're taking to get um, towards production. A lot of it is focused on, um, on the permitting and the advanced engineering, the uh, front end engineering design and, and moving into detailed engineering. So 
that part is is there. The team's in place. The money's in place. What's new and fresh is the expiration, and and we will not take our eye off the development uh, ball whatsoever. But we want to get the the expiration part of the business up and running as well. I think that makes a very healthy uh, company. Mm. Well, you also announced that the uh, hydro and, and geo geotechnical drilling has been completed. The one that you were talking to me about two months ago, you've drilled 12 holes uh, on time, but on budget. Uh, so, so I, I obviously like that. Is there anything to tell me about those holes and what, what they told you, or is that still uh, being analyzed? Well, there's, I guess they're still being analyzed, but, but the results that we've seen from them really tell us that our, um, that our mine plan and the feasibility study is, uh, it's fine. It's on track. We did not see any surprises. There's nothing that would, um, you know, cause us to, uh, to change, change our track in any way, shape or form. So it's really just more, uh, and necessary confirmational field data to support the front end engineering and detailed engineering. So these are just steps that, that we need in order to take us all the way through the next phase of, of engineering advancement. And now we're done all of that, um, that field work. There really isn't anything more to be done on that, uh, on that level. There's still obviously the ongoing permitting uh, side of the equation, but uh, it's, it's on track as well. So. Hmm. You also pointed, um, who was a Tetra Tech, I believe, is the lead engineer consultant for the feed uh, stage of the uh, of the development process, and they are supported by two other companies, by the way, right? It's uh, Clifton and um, who else was it? Uh, uh, Mining Plus, Mining Plus, yes, I think, Mining, right? Mining yeah. Plus and Clifton. Yeah. yeah, right. Is this is this customary having to hire three companies to help you go forward? Yeah, it, I mean, it is pretty typical. The the, the, the big group, of course, is, is Tetra Tech, and they have all the expertise in there. But, of course, um, when you look at Clifton Engineering, their, their expertise is more on the, um, on the, the tailings management uh, part of the business. All these groups work together, um, you know, and really answering to Tetra Tech, who answers, of course, to, uh, to, to Fission, but working independently, but I think it's, it's just a, it's hiring the best experts in the, in these various parts of the, of the business that all feed into the, you know, into the same, um, in, into the, the, the same direction. So you don't really, you're not working with a bunch of in, uh, individual teams doing their own thing and not communicating. It's all part and parcel of getting the best experts for that, that part of the equation and feeding it into uh, into the central uh, mine plan. Well, why I'm bringing that up, by the way, uh, and asking whether that's customary is because I saw a comment on social media, um, and this was referring to exploration team. But I guess, I guess this fell in line is that some something said something among the someone said something among the lines of uh, upgrade oh, another another few mouths to feed or something among those lines. So um, yeah, maybe you can talk to me about sort of the. Um, well, maybe you can talk to me about how much the uh, exploration team is 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 getting paid. I suppose that's uh, public information. Um, so, well, right. Well, look, our, our exploration team is really two geologists right now. We've got Kanan, who's the the vice president of exploration, and and James, who uh, is a senior geologist. Now, so you really have two employees. Now, Kanan is replacing a previous uh, vice president of exploration. So. Really, if you think about it, there's really only one new hire there. There's two new people. One has been replaced. So you, you really added one new uh, addition to the exploration team. But I think what's key here is Kanan can focus 100% of his attention on Fission Uranium uh, Corp and James as well. And as I said, these are these are two uh, two experts that, that have worked on, on for Fission for years and years. Uh, they understand the project right well. I think there's um, a lot of uh, economic savings in in not having to, um, you know, learn everything about the project, but to actually already have that in in your in your background and your, um, you know, for the, the the past several years of, of exploration without a learning curve in there. So, um, you know, they'll be. I mean, their their wages are competitively. Uh, competitive to other other people's position in in the same kind of company but I, I really 
just see one new addition of, of personnel uh, on our GNA, um, and that would be the the senior geologist. But you know, a, a next we'll hire um, other geologists and other uh, exploration team members more on a contract basis, on a seasonal basis, and that's once uh, once the program's uh, in place, budgets approved, money's in in there. Um, you'll you'll hire more temporary people on the uh, on the seasonal basis, but the other two will be full time. Okay, can you remind me again of of what your burden rate is? Because you just told me that you have. Um, what did you tell me they have in the bank of forty five million something? Yeah, roughly forty five million, okay. forty five to forty six million. Our burn rate G and A is um, we're about three hundred to three fifty a month. Okay. Okay, so it's around four million a year, give or take. Yeah, just under four million a year. Okay, okay. Um, so yeah, let's let's talk about capital. You have forty five. Um, are you keeping it there? Are you looking to raise more? How, how do you? Well, you know, the the capital we have certainly um, takes us over the next couple of years. So uh, I think that's the, the key part. Is we know we can get through. Um, most of the stages of development, all the the front, excuse me, the front end engineering on the permitting side, you know, it'll it'll basically, you know, over the next two years, that will be where all of that money is basically earmarked for, and we'll we'll have enough for that. Um, you know, I, I suppose that we're, you know, at the right opportunity, we would probably raise it, you know, additional. Um, funds and particularly for exploration more than uh, than anything because really the money I've got in place right now is uh, earmarked on the on the development side of the the equation um but uh you know you know I don't have a budget yet in place for 2024 although I suspect we'll be looking at you know 4 to 5 million dollars somewhere in in that range um uh you know that's that's part of the you know the business going forward is to continue to um you know, keep the treasury healthy, move it forward. But, you know, our big uh, capital um, needs, I think, are, are more on the project financing end, which, uh, you know, start to um, come into play in about two years' time. What do you mean? So, you know, then, then we're looking at, at uh, uh, much higher capital needs. For example, we, you've seen in the feasibility study, our initial capex, you know, would, would be just under 1.2 billion dollars canadian hmm. so you know i would say that um you know yes we have the, the the money right now to get us through the development stage there but once we get into uh the project financing you know that's something that that's still you know that's outstanding but these are relationships that i'm continue to build right now that we get the right people that are able to back this project uh you know financially and uh you know supportively um you know, to, to actually build a mine and, and move it into production. So those are, you know, those take a, a couple of years, I think, to develop those strong relationships. Right, right. I also saw somewhere, I don't remember where it was, and we talked about this last time when, for, for the possibility for you to come to some sort of an agreement with NextGen so that that drops your CapEx. Um, you don't know anything of that. You don't have anything definitive. So everything we say would be forward-looking statements are pretty much speculation. Perfect. But it, would it be possible that that slows down? Like, w will you go through with your own plan, regardless of what next gen does? And, and could it maybe slow you down because it might take next gen longer than it takes you to get into production? Um, you know, we're we keep our doors open and our conversations in the of, of having some cooperative agreement with next gen. I'm pretty certain they can also see the you know the benefits. Uh, for them to you know have cooperative agreements with us you know in, in operating um i would really like to see one central mill in the area for example um do we really need to see two of them built uh you know a couple of kilometers uh sitting beside each other I, I think that's unnecessary that's extra expense um we've already you know in, in our feasibility study we of course uh scope out the the project and the financing is, is the you know the the economic burden on it that we will be building our own mill be a, a self um sustaining operation but there's just so many benefits that you know where we can share an awful lot of costs and it's the same thing with next gen too 
I think both of these projects are moving forward at very similar um, speeds uh, to get up to production. They're about a year and a half, them being next gen, are about a year and a half ahead of us on the on the permitting time scale. Um, I suspect once they start beginning um, production, you know, it'll be longer before they get into the ore body than it would take us. Probably by the time we're producing ore, we're, you know, more or less on, on the same sort of timelines, I, I guess, uh, to moving ore out of the ground. But I think a cooperative agreement of some some sort would be, you know, beneficial to both companies. We don't have anything in place at the at the moment, but we're certainly um, very, very open to opportunities. Sure. No, no, absolutely. I can I can agree there. I'm just not sure on the timelines and how would it work if they say like, okay, we need another, let's say, five years to build. Are you waiting for them or are you not waiting for them? That's sort of what I was wondering. Yeah, um, I think you, um, I don't think it would really affect each other's timelines at all. I just think that there's um, there's benefits that we understand is sharing. I don't think they would cause uh, any slowdown in anybody's timelines in order to to achieve those um, those benefits. I think you'd see things move along at the at the same projected um, pace that they are. I mean, I really can only speak to ours, and mm. I know how long it takes us to go through the process. And what we expect to be in production, I'll let them speak for themselves. But I, I think if you look at the public information out there, there's, they're really on similar timelines, and I don't think uh, cooperation uh, would would change that at all. Hmm. Fair enough. Fair enough. The uh, number of shares outstanding, though, because we're talking about raising capital, the number of shares outstanding for you is getting pretty pretty high, though. It's like a, what is it, seven hundred million plus? Yeah. Uh, are are you? Still planning on doing something? I know you were planning on doing something for it to be able to uplist. So are you still planning on uplisting and are you going to be doing a rollback? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that a, a U.S. listing is is a critical um, part on our pathway to um, project development for, um, you know, to be able to move this, this closer, to be able to access the kind of capital that we actually need to, um, to finance the, uh, you know, the mine build and, and all the other needs. I just think it's, it, you know, the U.S. market is such an important place to be. Um, you know, it'll, it's certainly on my uh, near-term to-do list to uh, continue to investigate a U.S. listing, whether it be, uh, you know, an NYSE or a NASDAQ listing, I guess, um, you know, I'm still kind of going through that um, that that uh, scenario, but I think you're it's probably six one way, half a dozen of the other. I think the key is to get a, a big board U.S. listing. It is something that we're, um, you know, it's a pathway that we're uh, we're looking very, very uh, closely at. And, you know, I intend to um, be able to move forward on that, you know, in, in the latter part of this year and, and early 2024. So, um, you know, what would that take? Uh, I'd likely a consolidation of the shares, but done for a reason, you know, to do a, a U.S. listing, I think that would be seen as a positive to the market rather than, um, you know, consolidations. It depends what the what the reason for doing them are, but I think in our case, it's for a very proactive uh, reason to to be listed on the on the U.S. exchanges. So um, likely there will be a, a consolidation or certainly consideration of consolidation in the near future. Hmm. Okay, well that's a that's an aggressive timeline. I would have thought it it. it it would have taken longer, but I guess you're, you're already working on it on the background. So. Yeah. 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 I think so. I mean, it depends when you really start pulling the, uh, the trigger, you can do these things in depending on how well set up you are and how streamlined you are. You could probably do it in as short as three months, but I, you know, I think the more realistic, um, the more real realistic timelines are probably, you know, six months, seven months from when you, you know, start begin the process until you're actually listed on the on the U.S. exchange, and that whole thing is done. I think you're, you know, for us that would be the latter part of you know sometime in the fall here to uh, early 2024. Hmm. Okay. What else are you doing on the background? Um, I I believe the London uh, Nuclear Symposium is coming up. I think you wanted to go last time we spoke. Is that still something you're planning? Absolutely. No, September uh, begins a real busy season for us, um, starting off with the WNA, World Nuclear Association, uh, 
annual event in uh, in London in early September, which, by the way, you know, really is a is you know it gives you a pulse on the on the sector overall. You see all the the, the suppliers are there, the 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 builders, the reactors, all the, all the big companies, all the big players are there. It's a, it's a wonderful networking uh, opportunity and really you know kind of lets people see the health of the sector where the optimism lies out of that uh, you know those those meetings in early September so we're part of it I I go every year I think it's a you know it's such an important part of our business to you know to um to to learn all that you can out, out of that and be able to you know go back and and use that to help strategize what our approach is going to be over the next year um so that's in early September early to mid September and then I'm off to New York uh, attending an HC Wainwright um, conference of which we've been invited to, um, and we'll we'll speak at that event. And I think there will, you know, I mean, New York is also such a financial hub and such an important place. Uh, we have a lot of uh, existing shareholders there, and and a lot of uh, you know important names to um, continue to follow up and you know and make new introductions. So. I, I think that these conferences are very important. October's likewise, it's booked, um, you know, uh, similar type um, marketing investor uh, type meetings um, throughout October and November for that matter. So it's it right from, you know, early September, almost till Christmas, uh, we're going to be extremely busy and uh, getting our name out there, letting people know who we are, what we are, what our plans are. And, uh, I think it's an exciting time to be in the business, but you know you've got to get out there and and you know meet people again and and shake shake hands and uh, keep those relationships going. I I I actually agree. If you, if we had spoken like two years ago and you told me this, I, I would have probably thought like, okay, maybe he just wants to you know fly in a vacation to London or something like that. But I've been doing conferences, a couple of conferences over the last couple of years, and it's absolutely crucial in this space. Learned a lot, met a lot of people. It's meant a lot of business for me too. So it's, I mean, I can only imagine that it's actually important on the issuer's side as well. Uh, would you be looking to sign contracts though? Like, is that is it too early to sign delivery contracts? It probably is a little early for that. You know, at some point we'll have to um, be looking at that a little bit more serious and a little closer. What I wouldn't do is lock myself into a price contract. In other words, I wouldn't be signing agreements with fixed prices on uranium because I think the uh, the upward potential in the price of the commodity uh, you know it, it's super strong and it, it's much more weighted on the upside than the downside for the the price of the uh, commodity and and you know I'm certainly not alone in in uh, thinking thinking that and um, I think you'll be you'll find very few if any um, you know certainly developers and uh, even miners right now that are getting locked into lower, what we would consider to be lower uranium prices. So um, if we could, you know, have a contract or an agreement in place where you had, uh, you know, a floating scale of, uh, uh, of price to the, you know, the, the spot price of commodity, I think that would probably be a little bit more attractive to me than, than trying to lock in at some uh, price that I think will be far eclipsed in the, in the very near future. So. Hmm. So you, I mean, this is more of a of a John Borshoff approach than a than a chemical approach, if you will. Yeah, I suppose. But as I said, I think you'll find all developers have a similar um, similar scenario. And you know, John, yeah, that's really been his uh, his approach. Obviously, you know, Paladin was was uh, caught in the um, you know at the end of the last bull run by by not being able to you know have you know realize higher uranium prices but um i think we're in a much different uranium market right now than we were in the in the last uh in the last bull run that that would have ended in what would have been about 2007 ish type period i think this one is much more substantial i think you're looking at the upside in in uranium and nuclear energy measured on decades rather than trying to hit a you know a two or three year uh, small window. I think this is there's a whole fundamental paradigm shift in in energy and clean energy. The the realization of you know how key nuclear is to this overall picture that um, 
you know, I, I think the uh, the trend is certainly the long long term trend is is bullish and bullish for a long period of time. Hmm. Well, let's hope you're right. But it's also it's also challenging though building a company right on on only on spot price. Uh, it, it's it's attractive to investors, I know. But but uh, Mr. Borshoff, um also ran into some troubles last time when when Fukushima happened. Uh, which yeah. he couldn't have foreseen, but he did run into some trouble. So I guess it's a, I mean, it's a balance that you have to you make sure that you can run your business sustainably while also having the most exposure to the upside that is reasonable in your in your case. I, I think your point is, is absolutely correct. It is a balance, and it's something that you uh, you know you need to measure. You measure your risk, you measure your upside, and you you try to find the correct approach to um, you know to w what's best for the business. I'm not all, an all-in gambler i you know I, that wouldn't be my nature at all but uh, i'd certainly be looking at uh, being able to capitalize on on the upside um you know end of the equation i mean because we are long-term bullish on this sector and so we'll you know hopefully be able to take advantage of it got it got it well ross i think i'm i'm all out of questions is there something that you've been up to recently that you wanted to talk about but i'm failing to bring up um, I don't know. I think we've covered a lot of ground and I'm, I'm pretty happy the way the, uh, you know, with, with the, the conversation today, I feel we've been able to, um, hopefully enlighten the, uh, the listeners a little bit more on what our plans are for exploration, um, as well as development, but, uh, you know, stay tuned. I think there's a lot of news, uh, to come out. Um, uh, the sector only continues to get better and better. And, um, and I think you'll find that, uh, we continue to, uh, you know, Hit, hit our stride and um you know i think there's a long way to go on, on the upside for people that are looking at, at vision for um for value investing and um stay tuned got it i'll uh put up some of the contact information up on your screen i know that you have an excellent ir um ir people over there that can get to 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 everybody's questions so um yeah thank you so much for investing your time in me today and i'm looking forward to further conversations Fantastic. Thank you, Antonio.